So QYLD, man, I have not been asked my thoughts about an ETF this frequently since I think ARK investments a year and a half ago. And when I gave my thoughts on ARK, I got a little bit of what you'd call kickback. A little bit of, hey Brad, you're a jabroni. You're a donkey. And those types of comments didn't really age well, but what I'm hoping is that we could find a more mutual ground here with QYLD. Maybe not roast me in the comments and Hopefully it ages well for both of us. So in this video, I'm gonna give you pretty much three reasons why I'm personally not a fan of QILD. All right, I'm personally not, but it's a personal decision. I don't care what you do. And I know there's gonna be people out there that have come up with every single excuse in the book of why they should be invested in QILD. That's fine. That's fine. You keep telling yourself whatever you wanna tell yourself. This is for the people that are on the fence or the people that just blindly invest in QILD and have no idea what they're actually invested in because that's been a huge red flag amongst the people that I've spoken to. So let's dive into the video. First, the facts of QILD, what exactly is it before we talk about my opinions? So QILD is just the symbol of this ETF and this ETF is a covered call ETF that writes covered calls on the NASDAQ 100. So I think there's 106 actual holdings inside this one particular fund. And the first red flag for me is the amount of people that invest inside this covered call ETF that don't even know what a covered call is, do not know how a covered call works, or are just cutting corners, right? Because people say like, oh, well, I need 30 something grand or whatever to invest 100 shares into QQQ if I wanna do the same thing. It's like, yeah, save up some money, learn. Why are we doing this? Like trying to get rich quick and cut corners kind of thing. You must know what a covered call is, for me, in my opinion, if you are going to invest inside a covered call ETF. It's currently down about 18%, and I know people say, well, everything's down, right? The whole market is down, the indexes are down 18, 20%, okay, that's fine, I will agree. But there's a major difference for me that I'm gonna talk about in just a few minutes, and what that difference is, is I don't think that this can recover. I don't think QYLD is ever gonna recover from this 18% loss because of the way it operates, because of the way it's structured, unlike a stock that's down 18% and can change its fundamentals, this, that, and the other thing to make it go up over time, I don't think QILD can do this. And they haven't done it since they first entered the market. And it's been around for years. I think 2013 is when it first came out. And this is like really starting to catch hold now. So where the hell has it been for the other eight years of its existence? Or maybe it was popular or maybe just catching on now at YouTube. I I, I don't really know. The other thing that people need to understand because why are people investing in QLD? For the huge dividend, Brad, it pays a ridiculous dividend, 12, 13%. The fact of the matter is guys, no, it does not. It does not pay a dividend over 10%. It pays a distribution yield, which is very, very, very different from a dividend. I think it's it's dividend yield, which I'll flash on the screen, I think is like 0.35 and saying, who cares? We're still getting paid. Well, there's certain things like tax implications and, and how they can structure their dividend that you should probably at least know the difference between what a dividend yield is and what a distribution yield is. People don't. They just say, QLD, biggest dividend in the world. Yikes. But for the sake of this argument and not to confuse the simple brains here, we'll just call it a dividend yield, which the reason why it's so high is because the share price keeps going down. If you look at the dividend itself, it's been pretty much 20 cents per share since its inception. It's gone up maybe a little bit. I think I saw highs of like 23, 24 cents. It's gone down to like 17, 16 cents. But essentially for years, it's been right there at 20 cents per share. So the reason the yield keeps going up is because the share price keeps going down. And if we look at that dividend yield of 20 cents, it's actually gone down for the first time under 20 over the last couple months. And that should be another red flag. And I'm not jumping on the bandwagon here like, oh, it's having a couple bad months. Let's get on and crash and crush on QILD. No, 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 no. I've felt this way for a long time. I just didn't think that I needed to make the video about it. So now on to my opinions. Remember guys, that's all they are. 
They are just my opinions. I'm sure QILD fits perfectly into some people's portfolio or income strategy. And like I said, those people I'm sure are gonna get down in the comments and tell me all the ways they told themselves that QILD is great. I, listen, I'm not asking for you to talk me into it. I'm not trying to talk you in or out of it either. I'm just trying to give you information that maybe you have not found on your own. These are just my opinions. And I also know there's other covered call ETFs out there that have different structures that are a little bit different than QILD that, you know, maybe you'll be like, oh, screw QILD, Brad, you should be doing like, no, no, no. I do not want to be involved in any covered call ETFs. And I'll explain that coming up in the video. And I will just say full disclosure, guys, a lot of my opinions, I've seen lots of videos on QILD, but the, the first one I saw that was really against it, I got to give credit where credit's due, Mikey Millions from Kamikaze Cash. It must have been February or March. He made a video and I watched that entire video going, yup, 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 exactly, y the whole time. So thanks Mike for making that video in March. And it's kind of the reason why I never did. I just been always shooting people over to that video. Maybe I'll link it down in the description or something like that. But I will say that a lot of my opinions are directly in line with his because, and I, I think this is really only because he understands covered calls the way I do, maybe even better. And I think once you understand how covered calls work, th then it's a no brainer. QILD should probably be avoided as well as other types of covered call ETFs. And I think he's still invested in QILD. I know average Joe investor invests in it in a small, like I said, people will tell you all the reasons why you should, but once you understand what the covered call really is, there's, there's really no reason to. So for the first reason I'd probably avoid QILD is like, I personally like to separate my types of investments. Like if I'm going to do dividend stocks, I like to do dividend stocks. I don't invest in SCHD or VYM inside a dividend portfolio. I might invest in them in like a retirement fund or a Roth IRA, but like when I invest in a dividend stock portfolio, I like to invest in dividends. And the same thing holds true here. If I want to get the profits and the premiums and the benefits of a covered call, I'm just gonna do the wheel strategy on my own outside of ETFs. There's no reason for me to pay an expense ratio to anybody, just like I don't wanna pay an expense ratio for VYM or SCHD, when with a little bit of knowledge, I can make it and structure it exactly the way I want. And people, once again, will say, well, I don't have enough money to do the wheel with QQQ. I, I made a video about how I did the wheel with VTI, I think it was like 23 grand, and it really didn't make me that much more money as the ones I'm doing now, just blue chip dividend stocks that I wheel with. I just, I really like to just separate my investments. If I want the benefits of a covered call, I'm just gonna write covered calls on my own. I don't need a fund to do it for me. And I've also never been a dividend yield chaser. The whole idea of chasing a high dividend yield, which should be income, right? We want dividends for income. But when you say you're chasing a high dividend yield for growth, it just seems a little bit counterintuitive for me. For me, if I want to grow my net worth and grow my portfolio, I'm gonna invest in things that definitely are a little bit safer, that I don't have to pay an expense ratio on, that are not depreciating assets like QILD, and I'm gonna get a better return. If I want income, I'm gonna to shoot to things that aren't as risky, that pay me a pretty standard income. And like I said, it's just counterintuitive to be like, I want a 12% dividend portfolio so I can keep investing inside something that's a depreciating asset. Like I said, when they came in in 2013 at like $25 a share, they've never been above that. Even through what was the, probably one of the greatest bull runs ever, they still could not get above that $25 mark. And there's a reason for it. The reason is the way it's structured. And what's the major argument for that that I'm gonna see in the comments? People are gonna be like, Brad, I'm not invested in it for growth. I don't need a return. I don't need the share price to go up. I'm in it for income. I say, shit, then just give me 10 grand and I'll slowly pay you back over time. So I'll give you 25% on your money every single year as I pay you back. If you don't care about the share price appreciating at all, because by saying that, that's essentially what you're saying with QLD. If you don't want your stock or share price to appreciate at all, you're not in it for the growth. Like I said, ship me 10 grand and I will slowly pay you back that 10 grand at 25% per year. You could tell all your friends you're getting a 25% return, but your principal keeps decreasing, but that's okay because you're in it for the income. I'll pay you back that 12 grand, not to mention I'll charge you an expense ratio of 0.06 for holding on to your 10 grand that I'm gonna go invest somewhere else and make more money on and just pay you back slowly. Because when you invest in QLD, 
TYLD, that's all that's happening. The dividend yield, quote, dividend distribution, all it's doing is paying you back your principal slowly while the share price and the whole fund depreciates over time. And once it, I'm gonna to get to it next, this will not recover, mark my words, maybe I'll be an asshole in a year and you guys can just come back to the comments then. It's, unless they change the way they structure their fund, it cannot reappreciate. It cannot bounce back from what's happening to it right now, just like it hasn't bounced back since 2013. I'm not in it for the growth. Ugh. I'll pay you back, geez. Okay, so now why can't it recover? Why is this a depreciated asset? Because it can't come. Or what do I mean when I say that the way they have this structured is just, it's inevitable. It cannot recover. Okay, let's talk about covered call. And I'm talking to the people that understand what the covered call is. If you don't, I have hundreds of videos on the covered call. You can go learn that quick and come back here. Here's us for the covered call. We like to diversify, right? Have maybe a couple stocks that we're doing it. We maybe start with one and then we build it up. We start small with shares and stocks that have share prices that are low, right? Where it's only gonna cost me a couple hundred dollars or maybe a thousand because during this time, we're gonna be learning the covered call and we also realize you know, that the premiums, unless we make really, really, really big jumps in share price, is about the same, right? Then we write covered calls according to one simple rule. What is our cost basis? What is the average share price that we paid for our 100 shares? We do not write strike prices below that unless we wanna gamble, okay? And if it goes down, unfortunately, we just have to bag hold. And lastly, we like to close our options when we reach our profit targets. That's how a normal person that understands a covered call is going to operate the covered call and be successful over the long term, right? When you bag hold, yeah, sometimes you got a bag hold, I'm bag holding some things, but I have to wait for it to appreciate because that company is gonna raise its revenue, clear up its debts, uh, cut its dividend maybe, all these ways that we can increase our share price, right? And then when it gets back up close to our basis, then we could start writing calls again. That's why our portfolios can go down like they are right now. And with stocks, they are going to be able to recover. Why can't QIL do this? Because they don't do things like that. They don't diversify. They write covered calls on one index, the QQQ. Next, they do not care about basis. They don't care about structuring it or even taking a portion of their fund. They write covered calls 30 days to expiration with 100% of the fund, 100% of the fund at the money. It does not matter what their basis is. The, all they do is they snack up companies in, in the NASDAQ, then they write an at the money covered call 30 days to expiration. It does not matter what their basis is. To me right there, that sounds crazy because just like if we were to write a strike price below our basis, if we are to be assigned or it ends up in the money, we are going to lose money in our portfolios just like the fund would lose money if they ended up in the money. And because you collect premiums right when you do that, as soon as they write that, they take the money and then they can distribute it. What they also don't do is they don't have any like profit target buy to close strategy. Pretty much on the 29th day, the day before expiration, they liquidate, they go all cash, and then they repeat over and over and over again. So right now in a bear market, they start with a strike here, the share price falls, right? Then they write their strike here, and then the share price falls, and then they write their strike, this downward trend. When it goes up, what is the biggest con about the covered call? What is the biggest con about the covered call? Limited upside potential, right? So if we write an at the money and then we come out of this bear market, this recession, and the share price goes up to here, well, we gotta buy it back down here. And then we're gonna repeat. And if it keeps climbing, we, and there's just a cycle where it can't go up fast enough as it can go down because we keep getting that limited upside potential and we keep getting assigned down here at the money instead of writing about the basis, becoming profitable, then wheeling it by doing a cash score put. They don't do any puts, they don't write any puts. It's covered calls and covered calls only. And like I said, if you tried to do this strategy for the people that know the covered call, if you tried to do this, would this be a successful covered call strategy? Absolutely not. Why is it gonna be different with QILD? I, I, I just, I don't know. It's a get rich quick scheme, guys, just like ARC was. It's a get-rich-quick scheme, and you are going to... It can only depreciate so far. 
What's the share price at now? 20 bucks, less than that? You don't think it's gonna keep going down? <sighs> when has it gone up? It's never gone up. It's got like, oh, and then there's the limited downside potential. I think if you take the current share price of QILD, it's at like COVID lows. It's dumped all the way to COVID lows. Compare that to where QQQ is, the exact same index that it writes calls on, and tell me about the downside protection. And as I mentioned earlier, guys, with the share, uh, with this dividend yield going down, the reason why, like take for example, like Amazon, what those premiums were before and after the stock split, share price is going to dictate the premiums for that option. So as the share price of the index goes down, premiums are gonna go down and so are your distribution, which is why over the last three months, all of the 20 cents that they've been distributing per share for years have now dropped below 20%. Why? Because the premiums that they are collecting have gone down because what has happened to the NASDAQ over the last couple months? It has gone down. And if the NASDAQ continues to go down for however long it continues to go down, that means that the premiums are gonna go down, that means your distributions are gonna go down, and like I said, you're just getting paid back your principal slowly over time and giving them an expense ratio. That's how they're profiting off of you. It's a sinking ship, guys. And lastly, guys, I'm not touching it for the taxes. You're getting taxed ordinary. Right? They're not taxes dividends. And yeah, it might change, but how many people were smacked in the face last year when they invested all this money into QILD and they thought that they were getting regular, they're going to get dividend treatment on their taxes, and then boom, it was taxes ordinary income. Because it's not a dividend yield. It's a distribution yield. You must know the difference. And like I said, if I'm going to get taxed or if I'm going to make constant returns, I'm going to cut them down because by the time you take this amazing 12% yield, you take off ordinary taxes, which for most people that have a decent income is gonna be 30 to 40% of that. Then you give them their expense ratio, boom, you might as well have just stuck with a regular old dividend yield, nice average yield that everyone's doing, blue chip, dividend kings, dividend aristocrats. It's, I, it just doesn't make any sense to me if you do your research. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm gonna kick myself later and this is gonna be the greatest thing that's gonna shoot up to $100 a share. I, like, maybe. I don't know, but from the way it looks, man, shit. I avoid the short-term get rich quick, chasing high dividend yields and high, like these are the people that invested like in staked money in crypto, how they doing guys. I like to just personally get rich slowly. I'm old, I'm a boomer and that's just the way it is. I'll take my 5% of my dividend portfolio or whatever and if I need more than that, I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna do things that are gonna return me more without depreciating my capital inevitably. Am I gonna do some things where my capital goes down a little but can recover? Yes, but you need to explain to me how QILD is going to recover when they continue to write at the money calls with 100% of their fund. But this is just a small portion of my portfolio. Like I said, I don't care what you do. I do some risky things with 10%. If, if this is your spec play, go for it. Just once again, tell me how it's gonna recover the share price. And if you're not in for growth, like I said, you're in it for the income, then shoot me some money and I'll pay you back slowly. By learning the covered call and by learning the wheel, you will make more money in this and it will be easier. I promise. Talk to anybody in my Discord. Somebody will probably comment here how much money you can make with a simple share, like a symbol like Intel, even whose share price is down. You make more money wheeling that than you will with QLD. People in the Discord and people that I know that trade the wheel and trade the covered call, 12% a year is done no problem. 1% a month is done no problem. And they're doing them with stocks that are also going to appreciate over 